Hi there, today is Monday, August the 14th, and we're reading 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And now in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul is writing and he's beginning to talk about some instructions for people, uh, some uh, ways that we should live. Uh, he'll get into spiritual gifts and things later on and what love is and all these things. But in chapter 10, he gives a warning from the history of the people, uh, referring back to the Old Testament, things that had happened then. He talks about the Lord's Supper and how, uh, why we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And then he talks about freedom. That's what I want to talk about for a second. As I read through this, this just stuck out to me a lot. It begins in verse number 23, chapter 10, verse 23 of uh, 1 Corinthians. Uh, Paul writes in here about freedom, and the reason it sticks out is because we live in a nation. Uh, I'm assuming you live in America as I do. Many, uh, most of our uh, watchers for this do. Uh, we live in a nation where we love, we love the word freedom. I am free to do whatever I want, or we'll say, no one can tell you what to do, or, you know, I'm proud to be an American, the home of the free, the home of the brave. We, we talk about these things. We love freedom. But when we read in the Bible, we talk about freedom in the Bible, sometimes we get confused the concept of biblical freedom and the concept of American freedom. The two are not the same, not the same at all. I'm glad I live in America. I love living in this nation. I, I love living here. Uh, I, I'm glad for my home. However, I don't, want to, I don't want to confuse the two things because if I begin to think about freedom in Christ, like I think about freedom in America, I'm going to get all kinds of messed up. This is what Paul says in verse 23. He says, I have the right to do anything. He's quoting other people. You all say, I have the right to do anything. That's what Paul says but not everything is beneficial. Or, I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. He says, no one should seek their own good, but the good of others. And this is such a difficult lesson for us to learn, especially as American Christians. There's the idea, you know, Jesus in the Bible says that it was for freedom, we were set free, we live free in Christ, we're free from sin. But that does not mean you get to do whatever you want does not mean that at all. It means that you are free to walk out of sin and submit yourself to a good king, a godly creator, the one who made everything and made you in his image. You are free to walk out of sin and submit yourself to him. That's freedom in the Bible. You say, I have the right to do anything. It may or may not be true. I mean, you have the right to do a lot of things. I have the right to do a lot of things. I could, I could use any kind of language I want for better or worse. I can use whatever word I want to. I could, uh, I could drink at whatever I want as much as I want of it. I could ingest whatever chemicals. I could treat somebody else terribly if I wanted to. I have the right to do some things. Doesn't mean they're good. Doesn't mean it's a good idea. Doesn't mean it's beneficial. Doesn't mean it's constructive. Doesn't mean it's godly. Doesn't mean it's the mark of a good husband, a good father, a good person. I have the right to do a lot of things, but I don't. One of the most difficult things to realize when we follow Christ and we live in Christian freedom is to learn the art of limiting ourselves for the good of other people. Uh, just for example, uh, first of all, and we could debate this if you'd like to sometimes, shoot me a message, I'd love to talk about it with you. I'm not convinced that the Bible says all drinking is a sin. I am convinced the Bible says being drunk is a sin. It's not a good idea, right? But here's the thing. I could go out to Walmart today and I could go and pick up some kind of alcohol right there and you might see me there and you might think something if you saw me there. In fact, I've known people, I've known people that have worked in churches and that have done this, been caught in that moment buying some kind of alcohol thing and they've had people leave their church because of it. I, I I will tell you right now, I don't drink at all, so this would be a far-fetched thing for me, but you could catch me saying certain words, telling certain kinds of jokes, doing certain kinds of things in certain kinds of places, and you would immediately think something that might affect the way you follow Jesus. And so for me, to be free in Christ means I limit myself. I limit myself. I say, I could do that and that, but I'm gonna draw the boundaries in a little tighter on myself, not because I wanna be legalistic, not because I want to be pharisaical, but I want to limit myself for your good. 
So I want to encourage you, as you look at your, your life through the lens of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I want to encourage you to make sure you are looking to Jesus, the perfect example of everything. Make sure you're looking at people and realizing people think things that aren't true sometimes because of the perspectives that we have. People feel things, they, uh, they experience things based on what you do, so realize that. And then you take a next step and you might look at your life and you say, you know what I'm going to do? For the sake of other people, for the good of them, I'm going to limit myself in this area. You might say, I kind of enjoy doing that, but I'm not going to do that anymore because it's not good for others. I enjoy drinking this, eating this, going there. I'm not going to do those things anymore because I want to limit myself for the good of others. Other places in the Bible, it talks about not being a stumbling block to people as they follow Jesus. We don't want to be stumbling blocks to the people. I want to be springboards, helping people follow Jesus even better. Uh, chapter 10 ends, and then it kind of flows into chapter 11. In chapter 11, verse 1, I want to... I want to read it to you because it really ties in. Paul ends this whole thought of limiting ourselves for the good of others. He says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Uh, maybe you've heard it written like this, imitate me as I imitate Christ. That was an older translation here, an older version. I want to live my life in a way that people can look at me and they can do exactly what I'm doing and draw near to Jesus. I want to live my life in a way that people can follow me and as they follow me they find themselves more like Jesus themselves. Now sometimes that means I say no and I pass on things that might not be sin but just aren't beneficial and I pass on it. I avoid it. I, I limit myself for that. I want to encourage you to consider next steps. When you go to work are there things that you maybe have been doing that aren't sin or you justify as not sin but maybe God wants to ask you to limit yourself for the good of the people you work around or in your family or wherever you're at that is true freedom in Christ being free to walk out of sin and to submit ourselves to a holy standard that is biblical freedom and it's very different than American freedom but that's what you're called to I'm going to read to you 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and then I'm going to pray for us at the end here. If you haven't read it yet, I encourage you to listen along, maybe read along. Maybe you did read it, you want to just hear it again. Uh, this would be a great time. Just close your eyes and listen, just for a minute. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, he says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. This is the Old Testament stuff. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples, and they were written down as warnings for us, on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so you can endure it. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we gave thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf. We, who are many, are one body. For we all share the same loaf. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? Do I mean, then, that food sacrificed to an idol is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No. But the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of 
demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he is? I have the right to do anything, you say. But not everything is beneficial. Oh, I have the right to do anything. But not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Now if an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it, both for the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of conscience. I am referring to the other person's conscience, not to yours. For why is my freedom being judged by another's conscience? If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so they may be saved. Follow my example, as I follow the example of Christ. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray you would show us how to live. You would protect us from the temptations that have uh, fallen on many. You would guide us to better ways to live. And I pray, Father, that we would learn to be free in you and in our freedom that we would limit some of the things that we do so we could let people see you more in us. I pray you would you would revise the way we see our lives and the world and that we would recognize the immense responsibility we carry as your sons and as your daughters. And I pray, Father, we would faithfully portray you in everything that we do so that other people could follow us as we follow you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's been a great time with you today reading the Word of God. I pray you would meditate on these words the rest of the day. Join me tomorrow as we continue reading 1 Corinthians 11. And church, until I see you again, you are sent. Have a great day.